All right, good morning and welcome to today's meeting of the King County Regional Homelessness Authority. Uh, I'm calling this meeting to order. Sarah, will you please call the roll? Nancy Backus. Here. Claudia Balducci. Here. Angela Burney. Here. Dow Constantine. Here. Jenny Durkin. Here. Lorena Gonzalez. Here. Jonathan Hemphill. I can see you. Um, <laughs> oh, wonderful. Thank you. Andrew Lewis. Present. Kirk McLean. Joe McDermott. Here. Ed Prince. Here. Zanita Reed. Here. We have 11 in attendance. Thank you so much, Sarah. In a few minutes, we'll begin public comment. If you would like to sign up for public comment, please enter your name and city in the chat now or raise your hand. Each person will have two minutes to speak. Um, as a brief reminder to our members, if you would like to speak, please raise your hand by clicking the button on the right side of your screen. If you have any problems with the raise hand function, please comment in the chat. Sarah and our staff team will work to help you problem solve. Uh, we're gonna move on to approval of the minutes. We have minutes from January 1st February 4th, uh, March 8th, and our March 18th meeting. Is there, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. This, this okay. is Nancy, I'll second. All right, it's been moved by Angela, seconded by Nancy, that we approve the minutes from January 21st, February 4th, and March 18th. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it, the uh, minutes have been approved. All right, we're on to public comment. Um, I've already told you, we have 15 minutes allocated for public comment today, um, starting now. All right, um, thank you. A uh, reminder folks, we are now starting public comment. For those on the phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand and I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. We currently have two people signed up for public comment. Uh, the first is Cindy Druska, followed by Bill Curlin Hackett. Cindy, one second while I unmute you. All right, Cindy, you should be able to unmute yourself. You are ready to start. Okay, well, I only have two minutes, so that's not gonna be a lot, but I, and I wanna say before I comment, I have met some King County employees that seem to care. And some nonprofits that seem to be doing a good job. But overall, we don't have anybody really in the regional homeless program that is based in human services and really considers the person. Um, I'm glad that Mark is thinking regionally. Thank you, Mark. Please have people in charge of their regions so somebody owns it when it does well or they own it when it does poorly. Um, affordable housing and tax credit is not working. You really should do a study. Most people are rent burdened in tax credit. And nobody wants to acknowledge that. It's, it's not working. Uh, there's no subsidies. They go into affordable housing, rent burdened. People who take um, permanent supportive housing vouchers should also not be allowed to rent burden above 40% because what happens is when you take your vouchers in a certain portion of the building and then you rent burden everybody else, it's the most toxic apartment I've ever seen. There is so much violence and drug abuse and there's children there, there's elderly there, there's disabled there. So if somebody wants to contract for your vouchers, they should agree not to let people move in rent burdened over 40% of their income because all it does is create one of the most saddest pieces of property I've ever seen in my life. Um, I want to just end with this statement. It's a crime that happened at a building where children are. It happened real recently. I'm going to read it. This happened in the most expensive zip code in King County that has a tax credit apartment. Okay. At this time, I was afraid blank might be trying to access a firearm from the rear waistband with which to injure or kill me as officer blank, so I raised my rifle, by my patrol rifle and pointed it directly at his chest. I then in a loud voice ordered blank, show me your hands. He then pulled both hands from behind his back and I saw they were empty. 
Upon seeing this, I lowered my patrol rifle and no longer pointed it at blank. He continued to be aggressive and yell at me. This is in a permanent supportive housing with children cowering behind the door. This doesn't happen. It happens a lot. We are hurting our permanent supportive people so bad. I just, hey, I'm done. Apologies to interrupt you. Your time is up. Yep, yep, I'm done. Thank you. Next, we have Bill Curlin Hackett. Bill, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Ready to start when you are. Uh, governing committee members and new CEO Mark, welcome. Uh, remember the pool rules that sign at the local pool, don't run, no diving into the shallow end? Well, we've had two prior homeless plans that lived high on providing such rules, and such rules still abide too often. Maybe it's the resumption of having to move your lived-in vehicle every 72 hours, even though during COVID we have seen better stability and safety with that rule suspended. Or maybe it's a city moving the homeless out to other cities because that city does not offer services, the rule being we don't do that. Or maybe it's another city squeezing in legislation where punishments may occur to the homeless due to their failures to be accountable. Maybe it was getting our state bill passed last year and having jurisdictions, especially East King's largest one, try to grandfather in their onerous prior legislation that violates federal law protecting faith communities hosting the homeless. That bill was ESHB 1754. These and more are the insistence on business as usual. Business as we did it in the prior plans. These all failed to accept the theory of change. Now there's a charter amendment for Seattle proposed the latest rebellions against the theory of change, imposing rules not listening to the vulnerable. You know, I couldn't even find the theory of change on the KCRHA website. It is, if we create a homeless response system that centers customer voice, then we will be able to focus on responding to needs and eliminating inequities in order to end homelessness. It is time to start listening better. It is also time to fund the LEC without letting the onerous RFP process determine its fate. Give the LS LEC offices and staff now. The LEC witnesses the theory of change. We start listening or we succumb to more failure, and I know none of you at this table want to fail again. So I wish you the best and the wisdom to do the right thing. Thanks. Thank you. That was your two minutes. Uh, Chair Prince, we have no one else signed up for a public comment at this time. All right, thank you, Sarah. Uh, we're gonna move on with the agenda. Uh, uh, next item up is the ratification of committee bylaws. Uh, we will now consider Resolution 2021-04 to ratify the Governing Committee Bylaws by resolution for purposes of sat satisfying the provisions of the interlocal agreement. No changes, amendments, or modifications have been made to the bylaws from the form that was previously approved by motion of this committee. This resolution also ratifies actions taken pursuant to the bylaws as previously uh, approved. I'll entertain a motion to adopt the resolution. So moved. This is Nancy. I'll second. All right, it's been moved by uh, Angela, seconded by Nancy, that we approve the uh, resolution. Um, is there any discussion on this motion? All right, hearing no further discussion, we'll now move to a roll call vote. Sarah, will you please call the roll? Nancy Backus. Aye. Claudia Balducci. Aye. Angela Burney. Aye. Dow Constantine. Aye. Jenny Durkin. Aye. Lorena Gonzalez. Aye. Jonathan Hemphill. Aye. Uh, I recorded that as an aye. Uh, Andrew Lewis. Aye. Kirk McLean. Joe McDermott. Aye. Ed Prince. Aye. Zanita Reed. Aye. That is 11 ayes, zero nays. All right, resolution 2021-04 is adopted and will be signed by me to chair today's meeting. Uh, next up, we've got introductory comments from our incoming CEO. Um, we will now hear introductory comments from um, our CEO, Mark Domes. Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, hi, everybody. It is a delight to be with you all in this role. Um, I don't have uh, a lot to say with regard to introductory comments. I want to be brief <clears throat> and respect time and get to the actual uh, substance. I will simply say there's a lot to do. <laughs> uh, there's a lot to do. I um, What I would sort of offer as a frame for today's conversation, for the conversations I will be having with you, uh, both in these meetings and uh, I'm sure individually and in groups over the next several months, is we are already seven months behind. <laughs> And uh, I just, I keep saying that every single day um, because I think it informs, right, the, the pace that we need to move at um, and the sort of recognition, right, that we are seven months behind inside of a global pandemic, inside of a recession, inside of many factors, right, that will exacerbate housing instability in the region. Um, and so the need to move uh, quickly but deliberately and to find the balance between those while ensuring equity in all that we do, right, like there's never been a time where it is more on the line than this. Um, I really, really uh, am hopeful. I remain um, dedicated uh, to the idea, right, that this region can successfully end homelessness, that the, the resources, the knowledge, the capacity all exist. It's a question of how we bring all that together. Um, and I uh, very much believe in the uh, capacity of the authority to do that. Um, I also think, right, that, uh, and, and I'm, uh, I know this won't come as a surprise to anyone, right, that no design is perfect. <laughs> And so there are going to be things that like, we're like, oh, that's not working. Um, and that's fine, right? I, I want to be really clear about that up front, that trying a thing and it not working exactly as uh, it's designed is not failure unless you keep trying it. Um, so I also expect that as we begin the process of, of setting up the authority and really driving into implementation, that we'll discover that certain things are not quite what we wanted them to be. Um, and when that happens, right, you have my commitment uh, that I will always speak about that in candor. I will say like, oh, it's just, it's simply not working. <laughs> and so what we need to do now is figure out how to make it work. Um, at the end of the day, uh, my job, the job of the authority, will be to house people. That's what I am going to be getting up every day to do as long as I have this job. And I've frankly been getting up every day to do long before I had this job. Um, and so we'll be really looking at our success through that lens. Um, and uh, as we begin to get our hands around frankly, the data, um, what's happening in um, regions that we have not necessarily had the right kind of information uh, in a granular way, right? Thinking about the east side, thinking about South King County, to really understand the numbers, we'll then move to really getting clear on what our takedown targets are, right? So you can also expect that uh, we will be a data-driven agency, that we will be accountable and transparent. Um, our responsibility to the public as stewards of public funds, right, is to make the most out of every dollar, uh, and we will do that. Um, I also want to be really clear up front that we, and we all know this, but I just want to say it out loud, right? Um, at some point, I will ask you for more money. I don't know what it's going to be for yet, but I'm gonna. <laughs> and I just, I'm going to say it now. <laughs> that like, my goal in the first uh, 18 months is going to be to make something that is operant and is efficient and that we can understand what each dollar buys, right? And then from there to be able to translate that into the subsequent budget asks and conversations across the region about what we need to invest in order to get to where we want to go. Um, I will not, right, just say like, oh, we just need more money and I'm not sure what it's for yet. That's not going to be the standard. Um, and I just wanna make sure that, uh, you know, we're all clear and that I'm clear with the public about that as the, um, the uh, impetus of our, our work. Um, and the last thing that I would simply say, and this is um, frankly more for our public attendees than, than for the governing committee, but I will say, um, I am asking everyone for like a hair's breadth of patience. Um, because the opportunity in front of us is massive. It is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I feel highly privileged to do it, to build a government agency from scratch. Like people don't get to do that, but it also means that, that I am, I'm building a government agency from scratch. <laughs> and so the kinds of things that are normally in place, right, are simply not there. Um, and so many of the things that people are already asking uh, me as the employee of one to be accountable to, I absolutely am eager to be accountable to. And I 
uh, just barely got an email address up and running a couple weeks ago. <laughs> so I <laughs> would just ask folks um, to keep sending us the things that you want us to focus on. I think it's important that we hear from you routinely. We will figure out how to respond so that you're not just throwing stuff into the void. Um, but I do ask that everyone uh, give us a little bit of time to really turn the lights on um, before we are able to be as responsive as we uh, would like to be. Um, so those are my, my opening remarks, Chair, um, and I hope uh, that I was brief. <laughs> you, you did great. Are there any questions for Mark? Go ahead, Nancy. Thank you. Mark, uh, I just want to say welcome, and we are excited to have you here, realizing that, as you said, it is a daunting task that you are facing. We are here to support you. I have no doubt that you have heard that I was a little hesitant, but I did vote in support of having you in this role. So uh, as I've said to a couple of reporters, my, my issues were uh, addressed and you have my full support. We are not always going to agree on every issue, but you have my commitment that I will work with you and not against you. Uh, as we all have the goal of ensuring the safety, the health, and permanent supportive housing for everyone who right now is in an unsheltered state. Thank you, Rebecca. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, I will just say, like, candidly, I, I appreciate the candor I had heard. I'm really grateful that you are, are putting it out there right now and in front of everyone. And I hope, honestly, that that can be a model. <laughs> but like, we, like, sometimes people don't agree. <laughs> and like, that's fine. I am not, um, I'm from the Midwest, right? Like, we, we're very, we're plain spoken people. <laughs> um, and so I, I'm really looking forward to working with you. And I, I do expect um, that when we disagree, we will always have the, the uh, best possible outcomes in mind, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Nancy. Angela? Yeah, just to concur with um, Nancy, um, I'm, I welcome you with open arms. I am quite excited. I completely agree we're seven months plus behind, um, and I look forward to giving you and um, from me, from SCA, from my city, full support to help us get people housed. And that, that you have my word, that that is where we're all focused on and that's the work we're going to do. And um, I'm very excited to have you on board. I, uh, I, it is a daunting task for sure. And, um, and I will, I, I, I feel your concern with you, now you have an email, so at least you can get started from there. Um, and, and I also know that this is a daunting task to set this up. So um, the support you need is here for you. Uh, very excited to get going and do the work. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Claudia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to briefly also add my words of welcome. Uh, I think Mark, you and I are in slightly similar positions in that we just both arrived to this organization. Uh, after having spent some time on how to set it up, then kind of a, a, a long period of not being engaged and now being very, very deeply engaged. So uh, I really take your words to heart and I appreciate them. And uh, I'll, I'll give you my commitment to to do what I can to uh, to manage the desire to get things done right now, uh, because we need to build our processes and our people and our strength in order to be as effective as quickly as we can. And if we try to go too fast right here at the beginning, I think we will actually get in the way of getting results as quickly and effectively as we can. So I think you've given us some some good uh, wise advice to start with, and I will absolutely do my part to support you in what you need to get this organization to become a thing that can really perform for people. So welcome, thank you. I really look forward to uh, supporting you in this work. Uh, thank you, Claudia. Andrew and then Jonathan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I'll just say, Mark, I'm very uh, excited for us to finally have a governance uh, board meeting um, with the presumptive CEO present to get the the overview that you provided. Uh, I wanted to maybe take the opportunity if, if you'd be willing to indulge, Mark, just to uh, maybe ask if you have some preliminary guidance now, it's okay if we wanna talk offline, because I know you're 
you know, it was just mentioned, just got the email account. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of pressure um, on the city of Seattle right now uh, to scale up a lot of shelter to meet the, the exigent issue that we have on the street, which is that too many of our neighbors, thousands of our neighbors are currently experiencing homelessness and it's presenting with all sorts of related um, public health and, uh, and other issues. And, you know, the, the timeline that you laid out uh, is probably going to have to coincide with the city of Seattle doing some other things simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if we could have a conversation about reconciling those two paths to make sure that uh, eventually the paths will fold in. Um, and I wonder if you have any uh, initial thoughts um, regarding that uh, right now, um, uh, knowing that, you know, we, we have a shelter surge program where we're going to have 545 additional shelter spaces opening. Uh, we have some more in the pipeline that will probably stand up through the American Recovery Act money. Uh, we've got this charter amendment proposal that's on the horizon uh, that's going to mandate 2,000 spaces uh, within the city of Seattle uh, by the end of 2022 if it passes. Uh, you know, I think like you, uh, my reaction to this is why wait, you know, let's, let's go, uh, let's get moving because the, the pressures are so big. Um, but I wonder if you could just comment on that, knowing that because of the exigency of the moment, Seattle's going to have to move a little faster. What's your vision on how we can fold those things together um, on your timeline? Because some of this will be uh, building an airplane as we fly it. Uh, and I know you're up to the task, but if you have some initial thoughts, I, I think it'd be good to hear, um, hear those here today. Sure. Um, you know, part of the reason why uh, my start date is the start date it is and why I'm working before my start date um, is because of some of the issues that you've outlined, Councilmember, and um, the uh, mayor's team and the executive's team uh, at the county have both been um, very, very uh, transparent in uh, recent conversations about both um, planning around the recovery dollars um, and then also broader planning around homelessness policy. I, I think that, you know, uh, as I believe the executive and the mayor can both speak to, um, what we're going to have to balance in terms of operational uh, uh, strategy right now is capacity versus uh, desire, right? Um, so as a staff of one, I cannot manage the contracts of the city and the county, right? Um, I cannot run, you know, a, a regional RFP process. Like those are things that I'm not, I'm not equipped to do as a single human being. Um, so with that in mind, right, what the authority is gonna have a position on over the next, let's say 10-ish months, um, is really about coordination um, and, and thinking about how we are laying track in the direction that we wanna go. Um, that's the conversation that I've been having with both the county and city teams, um, thinking about the, the way in which uh, you know, we don't want to uh, take the recovery money and lay down track in a direction that ultimately, right, like we uh, may already know is not going to be long-term successful or is not long-term aligned with uh, the goals of the region. Um, that being said, right, what we also have to understand is that we are in a, a delicate moment. Um, and to the point that was just made, um, this is a moment where if we rush, we'll actually break it. Um, and so we need to be very careful about, uh, you know, again, all due haste, but making sure that we're really putting in place things that are going to be able to hold what we've got to do long term. So what I've been in conversation around has specifically been thinking about, um, you know, we're still not an operant authority, right? And so what that means is that there are fundamental tensions that exist between policy directions that we are not going to resolve right now. And that's actually okay, right? That the resolution is actually gonna come not through the tables that we're currently at, but through the processes and systems that the authority itself is charged with running and standing up. And that some of those processes and systems uh, with regard to sub-regional planning, for example, you know, something that I, I think we'll talk about a little bit with regard to staffing are things that I'm very anxious to get going so that the, again, the information that we have necessary to make the appropriate policy decisions is all in place. Um, Right now, there are pretty significant gaps um, in reconciling, you know, frankly, some relatively consistent data elements across all of the different spaces in the region that are counting the things. Um, so again, like in terms of like 
we want to run a surge uh, to uh, you know bring down X number of uh, folks experiencing homelessness. Um, consistency around right uh, who we are defining as homeless, like where folks are, all of that stuff is stuff that the authority is going to have a different charge to reconcile and to be clear about. Um, which will then allow us to inform policy decisions, I think, in a much more nuanced and granular way regionally. Um, I'll also say that I, I do think, um, you know, that the, the um, county team and the city of Seattle team are uh, being very thoughtful, um, and I'm very grateful <laughs> for how thoughtful they are, um, about including me in these conversations at this point in time, so that, uh, again, they are, are checking in to, to see if, right, the direction that they're headed is the direction that I'm interested in going and that ultimately the authority team will be interested in going um, as we look to bridge, I think, towards um, more permanent solutions um, and away from more temporary solutions. I think the other thing that we're really uh, lucky to have, uh, and I'm you know, looking at Zanid and Jonathan here, is a really strong relationship with the Lived Experience Coalition already, right? Um, so I've had several conversations with the LEC about what uh, they're looking at and thinking about, what they're hearing from people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness right now, um, and that is actively informing um, the conversations that I'm having with the city and county. Um, and is actively informing the, the beginnings of the long-term planning that we're looking to do uh, as we think about how do we build things, um, and this I think is, you know, gets to the theory of change that uh, Bill mentioned, right? How do we build things that people are, are, are going to use, right? That actually are going to work for people um, by centering their voices and hearing them when they say like, there is a reason that I'm not using this thing that is currently being provided, right? And so how do we make sure that that customer centricity, right, that belief that fundamentally, right, right like we are servants of a public. Um, and so as a result, we need to be hearing folks when they say, like, this doesn't work for me. Um, all of that is, is in flight right now. Um, and that, I think, is, is the um, most I can uh, assert about any of it. I feel very good about the coordination. I feel like, you know, sort of post, I'm already planning a um, uh, first, second, third week sort of blitz of, you know, like talking to people, listening sessions, really trying to like get, get uh, the lay of the land back underneath me to Councilmember Balducci's point about was in it and then have been away. <laughs> Um, so have some catch up to do. Um, and then from there, I think we'll be able to talk much more granularly about some of the, the needs that are identified from those conversations and how planning can match up to those needs. Um, but again, I just really want to uh, be clear that the, uh, the city and county have been very gracious in, in including me in the policy conversations that they're having about the um, uh, COVID relief money um, and the directionality all aligns. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, Jonathan and then Zanita. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. All right. Now, um, well, I guess Mark is really smooth because he already saw it coming. I was going to ask him about the theory of change, but he already addressed it. So props up to you, brother. Um, yeah, so you, you got me. Okay, good. I'm glad you. it's on your mind. <laughs> uh, thanks, Jonathan. Zanita? Yeah, uh, thank you. So happy to have you with us, Mark. Um, but yeah, I think it's speaking to what Andrew had said, you know, with these charter amendments and everything coming online and looking at all of our surrounding cities and everybody, I'm feeling like passing these ordinances that are criminalizing homelessness really um, is what it looks like. So everybody wants to sign on to these things. Yes, we want to get people off the street. We want to make sure that there's funding there, but we also don't want to move people from place to place to place. It's traumatic. So saying, you know, if you're not willing to take this, what we're offering, because we have it now, we have an ordinance that says, you know, we're, we're here to get people off the street. But if it's, if it's something that's not a good fit for you, say you want me to go to shelter because that's the only thing you're giving me. I know you say permanent supportive housing, but there's not enough of it. And if people don't believe that they're going to be able to stay there, even through uh, mental health, through all of these things, it's not, it's not gonna work. And that's why people aren't moving. That's why people are intense right in front of your businesses. They're, they're, they wanna be seen, but they want real help that's going to be sustainable. 
not that's going, I'm only going to be here for a little bit of time because already I've been out here in the elements and I'm struggling, you know? So if you see me now, I want you to make sure that you see me, you hear me. And when you come to me, you're true and you're honest and you're going to have something for me. So say you get me into permanent supportive housing, but then I'm having issues and things like that. You're real quick to kick me out. I have to go meet with the lady right now who was on the street for years. Now she's in permanent supportive housing, but because she's having issues with COVID, they want to kick her out. It's not okay. You've already experienced these things. So stop shuffling people. Stop saying, you know, we're going to sign this ordinance and oh, we're here to help. But really it's hurting. It's scaring people. And they're not going to want to do anything because they're not going to trust and they're not going to believe that you have their best interest at the forefront. And I'm seeing it going around all over. Everybody signing these little things. We're scared. We're scared. But these are people that were in your neighborhood. They probably lived on your street and lost their place. They probably lost their job. Like all of these things, they came in the darkness for some reason, you know, and everybody is pushing them out and don't want to show them the light. Well, I will continue to show you the light and keep showing up until you do trust and you believe. And while you are there, we will stay with you. We're not going to leave you. That is what it is. To me, social service is once you get somebody house, that's it. You're done. Oh, yay, we did this. But you didn't. You didn't. That's all I have to say. Thanks, Anita. I don't think that a lot of that was for me specifically at this point in time. <laughs> uh, but, but I will say that I appreciate what you said. And I think that um, one of the things that we, you and I have been fortunate enough to talk about already, right, is um, the need to uh, be, again, really centric around the person and around how we're thinking about um, everything past housing, right? And, um, you know, to some degree, right, like what I sort of refer to borrowing language from another discipline as attachment theory, but for housing, right? Like it, it's, it's not enough to just say like, here's a door. There's the question of how a person attaches to the house beyond that door. And you and I have had a lot of conversation, um, uh, not a lot, that's an overstatement. We've had some conversation, I look forward to having more, um, particularly about the, the uh, complex PTSD needs that arise um, from people's uh, trauma in the experience of homelessness, right? And I, I wanna hold that separate and apart from any other kind of emotional or psychiatric difficulties because the experience of homelessness is in and of itself traumatic enough to generate complex PTSD, uh, which in turn, right, means that like when you just sort of put someone in a house by themselves, they often have immediate PTSD reactions, right? Of like, it's too quiet. Um, they, you know, there's, there's uh, a, an inability to navigate the space and that triggers panic reactions, right? And so we really do need to be thinking about how, and, and I, you know, my commitment to you is that the authority will think about, right? Um, how we navigate um, the design of a system that can deploy the right kinds of supports that will assist people in attaching uh, successfully, right, to the housing options that we will be working to create. Um, the other thing that I will just say as a, as a um, way of continuing to model, right, um, is that I am well aware, right, of, of the ordinances that are, are proposed um, by some of the communities that are represented on this call, right? And again, I, I think that like where there are disagreements, it's okay to disagree. What we have to be able to do is have a conversation about it. Um, and I look forward, right, to again, in the coming weeks, being able to talk with people about like, what is it you're trying to address, <laughs> right? How can we be supportive of getting the, the root cause um, addressed and if we're gonna have a substantive policy disagreement, let's actually like figure out where it is, right? Um, and make the space for it to exist so that we're not uh, frankly trying to, to engineer um, a sort of false sense of kumbaya if we don't agree on something. But not agreeing on one thing doesn't mean we don't agree on the highest thing, which is we want to end homelessness in the region. The other thing that I will say um, related to that is that I've been um, in preparation for my formal start. I've been reading a lot about conflict resolution. <laughs> and one of the things um, that uh, the conflict resolution uh, uh, literature points to is that conflict resolution starts by listening to understand before you listen to persuade. Um, and there are actually like whole books on like, this is how you listen just to understand where a person is before you try to like begin to lens it into 
I need to persuade them to be on a certain wavelength that, that I agree with, right? Um, and so I'm really stepping into this job thinking about that as a primary function that I want to bring is like listening to understand before I listen to have a perspective. Um, because I, I fundamentally believe, right, that everyone on this call is a public servant. Uh, they, we all want what is best, and I don't necessarily understand how certain folks uh, on this call across the region have arrived at the decisions that they've made. And I'm not going to understand by trying to persuade them before I listen to anything. Um, and so I, I want to just put that on the table um, because I, I, I am hopeful, right, that we will um, be able to have the right conversations. And I want everyone to know that like how I will be entering these conversations over the coming months is trying to understand where you're at before I try to persuade you of anything. Um, and then finally, I'll, I will simply say as a way of sort of like setting the, the, the uh, table, um, I and the authority are not gonna take positions on voter initiatives or candidates. It's not a good, it's, not, it's just a bad idea. <laughs> um, I believe that we can end homelessness in the region. We will do that inside whatever system voters want because that's democracy. And like, I just like, like, yes, democracy is sometimes disappointing, but we've been doing it for several hundred years and it continues to disappoint, but like we're, we're it's what we're committed to. <laughs> and so like, I fundamentally believe um, that uh, if we're gonna be public servants inside democracy, there are some things that we're just gonna have to say like, okay, if you vote for it, then that's, what, that's the context we're gonna work inside of. Um, so, you know, on the charter amendment, on these kinds of things that I know people are, beyond, you know, beyond this group, just generally, like, sort of hungry for the authority to take a position on, we will not be. Um, like, if, if, you know, the voters of Seattle decide to pass that charter amendment, then the authority will operate inside the context that that creates. And we will end homelessness inside the context that that creates. That is the commitment, right? Whatever the context is, we will find a way to end homelessness inside of it, because that's the job. Um, and so I want to, I, I am taking an opportunity presented <laughs> by uh, a comment that was like only partially for me to do a little bit of table setting, I think, um, hopefully just around uh, some basics that I think people have been, you know, in my inbox, do you have a comment on about? Uh, thanks, Anita. Thanks, Mark. Are there any other questions for our CEO? If not, we're going to move on. All right, we are going to move on. Uh, next up, we will um, consider an update to the interim staffing plan proposed by our incoming CEO. Uh, for background, the governing committee previously approved up to five positions to be hired as the initial leadership team of the authority. The updated plan before us today will expand those initial five positions to 10 and are detailed in the immediate staffing request memo included in today's meeting materials. Uh, yesterday, the implementation board voted to recommend the proposed update. Uh, we'll now hear from our CEO again. Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, the memo you have in front of you is brief uh, because I don't have a lot of information. <laughs> what I do know um, is that I'm seven months behind and I need more help. <laughs> and so uh, the the proposed amendment is really in in uh, reflection of that. Like if if we were starting. Um, you know, in uh, September of last year, uh, you know, five to 10 to 20 to 40 would have been sufficient. Um, but just looking at the bodies of work that are in front of us that we need to be able to execute on in remarkably short periods of time, um, it, it, it isn't enough. Um, the two biggest bodies of work that I'm concerned about uh, are the sub-regional planning process and then like the, the building out of the structures and systems that are needed in order to run an agency. Um, and so the requests that you have in front of you um, are aligned with what I believe to be um, the sort of key seats necessary to have some hands in um, uh, to, to make that happen. Um, it's also frankly reflective of places where, you know, I don't have, and I'll just be quite transparent, like I'm good at a lot of things and there's some things I don't actually know a lot about and that's why I've always hired other people to do them. Um, and, <laughs> and so um, there are some key uh, spaces, right? Uh, particularly inside the operation space, the comm space, um, you know, some of the data management stuff that like, those are just not actually, you know, the highest and best skills that I have. Um, and so making sure that we have the capacity um, to again, lay down track in the right direction um, is what I'm really keen on. 
Um, my concern uh, about not having the ability to, to uh, put people in these roles um, is candidly that I would lay down track in the wrong direction, right? Um, and that later on, someone who was more skillful would come in and say like, okay, like, you know, looking at how you've architected this, we're actually gonna have to do a pretty substantive pivot in order to make it work. Um, you know, for example, thinking about data setup and server integration, as we look to migrate uh, HMIS from county over to uh, uh, the authority, for example, right? Like th those are things that I simply am not like skilled enough to do well. Um, the other thing that, you know, I will say is that, um, you know, with regard to the sub-regional planning, I consider that to be sort of like everybody's job right now. I do need a point person on it. Um, and I want to make sure that like we can start that body of work very quickly um, because I, I do not think it will be possible to create a full staffing plan until we have better information about what's happening across the region. Um, there are uh, substantive uh, questions I have right now that are not answerable, for example, about uh, the setup of programs where, you know, there's a, there's a just as a basic example, you know, do you design a team that is attached to programs regionally, as I believe was sort of mentioned in public comment, or do you design a team that's attached to programs from a content area, right? So are you responsible for East King County or are you responsible for youth programming across the county, right? There's not, to my mind, enough information on where providers are, how they are currently doing their work, what kinds of populations they're serving, to some of Zanita's really good points, right? What people are saying they need, right? Um, in order for, for me to make those decisions right now. So to my mind, uh, uh, at least a strong start to sub-regional planning is necessary in order to get to a full staffing plan. Um, the other thing that I will say, uh, which you know, I, I assume is on folks' minds, um, is that with regard to budget impact, um, my understanding based on the numbers that I currently have is that I can afford these things. I also want to be really clear um, that uh, these are salary ranges, not yet salary justifications. <laughs> Most people tend not to come in at the very tip top salary unless they really are walking on water. Um, and then the other thing that I, I want to be uh, really transparent about is that my understanding uh, is that the city and county are both currently working on reconciling um, the uh, admin availability, right, for 21 and 22 that will allow us to do projection into fiscal sustainability um, and to really fine tune what that looks like, which will then happen in accordance, right, with uh, the full staffing plan. Um, again, uh, I apologize for the sort of like, I have a lot of questions still. <laughs> I will be looking to resolve those questions um, quite rapidly. Um, but my request uh, today is really just for the provisional authorization to post roles. Um, these are not the final expenditures. Um, any final expenditure would have to be, you know, but budget allowable. And that'll be like, I have some numbers in front of me that, you know, sort of look at the through the end of the year. Um, and hopefully within a week or so, we'll be able to uh, right size that before we issue any offer letters in relationship to sustainability into 21 and 22. Are there any questions for Mark? Uh, go ahead, Nancy. Thank you. Mark, are you, are you hoping to get, uh, and realizing that you don't know who's going to apply, but are you hoping to have a majority of local individuals uh, who have perhaps been in this work previously or currently from our region? Are you looking, hoping to have people from outside of our region come in and look at things in a different perspective, a mix of those? Or have you, have you really thought about what, what the makeup of your team you would like it to look like? Yeah, that's a great question, Mayor. The answer is a mix. I think that there are um, some exceptional candidates who have done um, uh, for the roles that are posted, right? Um, who have done work in side environments that are similar to the one we're trying to build. Um, and that is, of course, like for some of these jobs, a real keen edge, right? Um, so for example, thinking about um, some of the operating roles, um, those roles, the more you can say to me, I've done work regionally, or I've done work in a multi-jurisdiction environment, the more I'm like, okay, cool, that's a great spot for you. 
for some of these other roles, for example, like sub-regional planning, I can't imagine bringing in a person to do that. <laughs> like, didn't already have a little bit of lay of the land, right? Um, I think that it's it's important, right, that we uh, sort of continuously balance the sort of, you know, you know, frankly, and speaking of myself, right, the the um, disruptive capacity and innovation that's possible when you have someone who's come in from outside, um, even if, you know, in my case, I'm very familiar with the region, but I'm, I'm still outside, right? I get that. Uh, and so, um, and then also thinking about some of these roles and saying, like, we really need somebody who, like, gets the, the all the way down the weeds, like, I, I know this particular thing. I also think that um, my, my hope, right, is that as we build out the staffing plan, we're able to, frankly, even play with that to a finer tuned degree. Um, and to really, again, think about how are we uh, approaching the creation of roles um, that allow us to, to do really tight focus on uh, things that we feel are, are very uh, important regionally and might require, right, again, a, a much uh, higher walk in the door understanding of what's going on. Thank you, Angela. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for that response as well. Um, and I really appreciated the detail that you went into in talking about putting this together. I am, I'm actually really happy to see you asking for more personnel. I was quite worried, um, you know, in hindsight, when we put the ILA together, when we got to hear, I'm like, and, and we can keep saying we're seven months behind, but um, I'm, I'm grateful that you're bringing that forward. I uh, appreciate the kind of the broad spectrum you're taking a look at. Um, and I think it's, uh, I appreciate your, you know, is it a program? Is it the whole, is it a region? Um, I appreciate, appreciate that look at it. Um, I, I, I hope that you have asked for enough people for now. Um, I, I'm a little, I, I guess I will say just from my, you know, I became mayor before the pandemic, right before it. And, um, you know, I think that uh, do not discount the, the support of admin support in a lot of this work, um, I think about the contracting and, and those areas and that expertise needed, whatever that looks like. Um, so I, um, yeah, I just, I just want to share that with you. Um, I want to make sure that you have what you need to get this going forward. Um, and I think the only other piece that I just wanted to share with you was that when we were putting the ILA together, you know, really the idea was to bring these uh, Seattle and King County and the, re the, the whole region together into one entity. And so I would love to see in your, in your plan, I think it, the public might appreciate um, how you're taking these two, these two big departments and making them one um, and creating those efficiencies. So I think that will be um, further down the line, not important at this moment, but at some point, I think I'd like to kind of hear what your thoughts are and where we're going with that. Thank but you. thank you, I appreciate you bringing this forward to us today. Thank you, I appreciate your uh, thoughtful comments. I, so on the last component of that in particular, a full staffing plan will speak to that. Um, like where are, we, where are we getting an operational efficiency? Wh what's, like, what's being unified in what ways? Um, I think to some of the other you know, questions that have been raised, where, where and how are we reconciling any uh, existent policy differences between things that we're bringing together? All of that is, is work that we will be um, looking to do in advance of um, coming to you with a full staffing plan. I think that the um, yes on admin support. I, I am again very grateful to the county that has offered um, some assistance in helping to uh, get me an admin just so that I'm not like sort of like well, I don't I don't know where I'm supposed to be today. <laughs> um, and uh, and we will again I think be looking at sort of figuring out um, what the balance is in terms of uh, you know administrative support versus um, uh, you know please just can you go do this? <laughs> and I think that right now, as you'll see in the roles that are, are posted, um, there is, you know, in every single uh, role where it gets to sort of like other things, right? It's like, you gonna drive around this county. Like that's, that's real. <laughs> like, like you are not sending anybody to go talk to somebody. We will be going to talk to people, right? Um, so I think that uh, right now there's very much sort of driving towards a startup culture of like, when you're young and lean and scrappy, like there's not a whole lot of like, can somebody else go do it? It's like a like, no, it's, we are the team, so we will be doing it. Um, and I, you know, I think uh, the, the sort of never too, never too senior to make your own copies, right? Like that's, that's, the, that's the mode we're in right now. Thank you, Angela. Uh, Jonathan. 
No, thank you. Um, thank you for your comments so far, and, and I'm hoping that we can get these, these staff people for you and, and get this passed. I'm um, also some of the comments for you that, that you made around, um, you know, and you, your sub regional planning. I'm wondering um, in regards to that and the subpopulations, right, and around youth and family homelessness, particularly around youth and young adult homelessness, are you like really considering how you're going to engage in that and how you're going to try to center um, folks with lived experience in those conversations around what they need? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, um, all of our, our listening, right, like needs to be uh, through the theory of change and prioritize the folks who are experiencing homelessness, right? Um, I think that to the same degree um, during uh, some of the design work, right, where we ran parallel tracks, right, where we worked extensively with people experiencing homelessness, and then we also worked extensively with people um, who were uh, doing frontline services and at the same time worked with a lot of administrators. Um, I'm imagining being able to do that, um, but frankly more robustly and, and uh, covering more ground. Um, again, because we need to, there's, there's huge missing pieces of, of information in our current understanding geographically. Um, that we need to uh, close uh, down on before we can put forward any sort of final planning. Um, and, you know, again, sort of related to that, I, I, I do think that, like, the more that we are um, taking in information from people experiencing homelessness, inclusive of subpopulation, the better we're, we're able to design the staffing plan that supports, again, the deployment of the right kind of program architecture, um, whether, and, and I, this is a policy question, I want to be really clear about this, that is not made, um, but it's, uh, there, are, there are questions about certain kinds of uh, programmatic efforts that we don't yet know, or I don't yet know, whether or not the authority itself will provide that thing, or whether or not we will bid it out, or, you know, like, th there are significant questions around that, particularly, again, when we start talking about places um, like unincorporated King County um, or the East Side, where there's less availability of um, providers or vendors who we would normally contract with. And so the, 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 we have to think about whether or not, similarly to how um, the executive and, and the county created uh, the Department of Local Services, right, to, to actually try to cover some of those places that were not necessarily connected through other kinds of um, uh, vendor architecture. So all those things are things that I don't have an answer to today. Um, inside all of it, though, you have my commitment that always we will center the voices of people with lived experience and people who are currently experiencing homelessness at the, the core of why we're doing what we're doing. All right, thank you, brother. All right, Lorena. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Welcome, uh, Mark. I'm really excited to have you um, join us and eager to see you get to work. Um, I have a few questions about um, this um, particular proposal and, um, and they're largely focused um, around sort of fiscal impacts and process and timelines. And, um, and I, will, I will acknowledge that um, I, I, I feel like we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit by asking for um, these positions to move forward without having a fuller understanding of the fiscal impacts related to these proposed positions or additional details related to what these positions will functionally do. I mean, we currently have titles for the positions, but we don't have much more than that, nor do we have um, information related to um, cost impact related to each of these positions. So I'm, 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 I'm struggling with understanding, with, with, um, with crafting uh, how, to, how to move forward on this particular proposal with, in, in a way that allows you to do what you need to do to get going on this body of work, but still um, allows us as, as members of the governing committee to head into the conversation um, related to finances, timeline, and the broader staffing plan with eyes wide open and having an understanding of how these additional five positions that are being proposed that were, that are supplemental to the ILA um, provisions are going to impact uh, programmatic services, for example. So I, I just unfortunately don't have enough information. And so I guess I want to get a sense from you, Mark, what 
um, what you think the financial impacts are here. And, and, and if you don't know that, I just want to sort of hear that you're, 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 you're thinking about it and what your process is for evaluating that. And then secondarily, um, I would appreciate knowing um, a little bit more what you're thinking in terms of the process and timeline for consideration by the county and the city for any additional resources that are going to be needed mm -hmm. related to these five, um, five positions. Um, those are uh, really good questions, Council Member. So on uh, the first one, so on budget impact, these are, are fungible. Um, inside the startup costs that are currently allocated from city and county. Um, the question that is outstanding um, is the degree to which, uh, like projection into 21 and 22. That's the piece that I don't have. Mm -hmm. um, I, I will say, right, that like, based on the analysis that's previously been done, I don't expect um, that we can't pay for them. Um, but I, that's, that is the thing that is outstanding that is between me and frankly, any offer letter that I would write, right? Which is like, I need, I need to be clear before I send a letter to someone that's like, Hey, you got a job, um, that the salary banding and the final salary justification aligns with what I'm sure I can sustain in fiscal year 21 and 22. Um, but in terms of just like, could I, you know, so like if, if it was a one shot, like, could I pay for these uh, positions for the remainder of the year? That is a thing that I, I am uh, currently able to say yes to. Um, and that's inclusive of a uh, friend. Um, related to that, though, is the, the timeline uh, aspect, right? Which is that like the expectation around, uh, you know, these roles, even if they were maxed, which I, again, I do not expect. Um, but even if they were maxed top of the salary ban, um, is that they would be prorated. And in fact, the analysis that um, I've uh, been looking at that um, uh, some of the city staff actually helped to prepare, so thank you, <laughs> um, has, uh, has them prorated uh, and loaded, right? And saying like, okay, so like, this is what this would cost at you know, six months, at seven months, et cetera. Um, in terms of the overall hiring timelines, um, I would like to, again, looking at the amount of work that's in front of us, right, so the positions that are posted now, the five that are up, it's, you know, this is posted until it's filled. <laughs> so, like, you know, until, it, like, when we get a candidate who's, you know, a strong candidate, we immediately start moving through the process. Um, the process that we've put forward right now for these senior roles um, is an interview with the Live Experience Coalition uh, and a panel interview, and that panel interview consists of myself, city, county, um, and uh, SCA uh, member staff um, with uh, questions that are, are uh, tailored to the role. Um, and then if those two things go well, right, then it moves into like the final step, which would be budget reconciliation and salary justification um, to say like, okay, you know, this is, this is the offer letter for this person. Um, I want to be really clear, right, that like uh, that process is, is architected in part to be able to move a little bit quickly because I am I am most concerned um, with being able to, to get the bodies of work done that are, are going to be necessary, frankly, in order for us to begin to transfer um, administration of, you know, contracts and federal funds and, uh, you know, city and, and county funds that have the actual admin and operations dollars attached to them that then allow us <laughs> to be sustainable inside 21 and 22. Um, so I apologize if that's a little bit of a all over the place answer, but like those are the things that I'm balancing. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to ensure, right, that we're able to bring things online inside the authority uh, in a stable way as quickly as possible so that we have the administrative and operating budget for next year. Um. Uh, Ed, is it okay if I have, if I ask? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So in August of 2020, the governing committee took a vote to authorize five positions. Those five positions included the deputy CEO and chief of staff, chief of programs, chief of community impact, director of equity and justice, and a director of communications. Um, and I think, you know, it, 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 appears sort of based on the 
draft organizational chart that we got from your former organization in September 2019 that those positions are included somewhere on that organizational chart. What I'm hearing as a need from you now it are five positions that are uh, in addition to those already five approved positions. So that would be the ombudsperson, the chief operating officer, a director of special projects, a special assistant and senior admin person, and a sub-regional planning manager. Um, and some of those positions are, you know, have uh, representation on this draft organizational chart. Some of them are included in the ILA. Some of them are not included in the ILA in terms of these new five positions that you're identifying. And so I, um, I guess for me, it, it creates the inference that because we didn't already give position authority for these new five positions, that that inherently means there will be additional resources required to um, support these positions both now and in the out years. And, and, I, I, and so what I'm not tracking is whether or not you believe there will be additional resources needed now in the short term, but also in the out years in order to sustain and support these additional five positions that you are now seeking authority for. Gotcha. I think I think I understand. Let me see if I answer okay. uh, in a way that makes sense. So um, for these for these positions, I do not believe at this point in time that I am asking for resources like like money beyond what is already allocated. I am asking for permission to, to reach into that pot of money and expend it on positions. Because what, what you've already given me is authorization to, to spend money on five positions, right? Um, and then uh, like sort of like, you know, stand up stuff. So like money to spend, like get in a business card, like getting computers, standing up an IT environment, right? Like those are things that I um, already have the authority to expend against. I do not currently have the authority to hire any additional staff outside the five that you've already voted for. So what I'm saying is I have the budget. What I need is permission. Um, in terms of the out year and the sustainability, that I, I have no reason to believe that these positions are not sustainable. Um, what, I, what I need, though, is the reconciliation between anticipated admin contributions from currently King County and City of Seattle, right? Um, at which point I can right size that inside what is a, a final salary justification uh, for anyone in order to ensure that we are looking at a, a sustainable position. Yeah, and I think, um, and I'm just flagging that I think, uh, I think that needs further study and evaluation. I, I, I am concerned that the budget that we approved is, for lack of a better term, a fully loaded budget that doesn't actually account for these additional five positions. And that, that means that there will effectively need to be additional resources allocated to fund these additional five positions. So I, I am concerned that this isn't just about green lighting your hiring authority uh, i'm uh, concerned that what we, what we are being asked to do is to incur additional uh, budget appropriations and allocations between the city and the county to both allow you to hire for these positions um, and also fund these positions both for the rest of the year but also in the out years and so i, I just i just don't have enough information and details and data to be able to feel confident that I have, um, you know, the, the, the information I need to say, yes, the current budget does actually cover these um, resources. Um, and I'm, I'm just hearing from my, my staff on the city side that, um, that that may not be the case. And so I, I want us to, again, uh, go into this with eyes wide open and make sure that we are um, acknowledging the potential 
fiscal impacts of doing this. I'm not saying that I am not supportive of the fiscal impacts. I just need to know what they are <laughs> before I feel comfortable uh, moving forward. And I, and I feel like I need to know what they are in the full context of the staffing, of the full staffing plan, because all of this will have impacts um, on the operations and management side, but also impacts on how much we're allocating to actual delivery of programs and services. And I just want to be mindful of, of those implications and want to make sure that I have a clear understanding on the city side um, as a member of the city council who's responsible for the budget appropriation exercise, sort of what that means for our internal processes for considering additional resources to be responsive to the needs that you're identifying. Yeah, I, so I'm, uh, I don't think I should share this screen, but I'm, I'm happy to follow up. Um, so what I'm, what I'm looking at uh, on, on my screen is, is an analysis of what, what my understanding is, right, based on what I've been provided of the uh, non-annualized startup cost against the additional staffing request and then like what's been expended what you know is slated to be expended and then what this does to that budget essentially right and so what what i am confident about based on the information i have anyway right is that inside that current budget these positions are fundable um again i have i have questions outstanding right about like what we would get to in terms of out year and and i don't yet have all the information i need in order to say again like based on that then here's what the final salaries need to be in order to to move um but i do not believe um and i want to be really clear about this um i do not believe that i am asking for additional money at this point in time right um, again, going back to what I said at the beginning, I will be asking for additional money. Like, that's very clear. <laughs> like, um, but I, I don't have the information necessary at this point to even really know what I would, what the amounts that I would be asking for. And to the, the point of a full staffing plan, um, to me, right, the ability to have a team that has the breadth and depth necessary to articulate all those needs is that's that's what i'm asking for like my concern is that if i if i don't have uh these particular kinds of expertise and supports um that we will be doing this in a um in a way frankly that is that is slower than we need in order to execute on the transition and transfer of the uh contracts and and um both federal and local right that the uh city of seattle and, and king county are currently holding which in turn gates our ability to have operating an admin come off of that, right, in 21 and 22. And, and I, think, I, I think we're sort of in the same area here in terms of this conversation. I just, wanna, I just wanna acknowledge that this decision now, making this decision now without sort of understanding what the, it, what the sort of the ripple effects of this decision are on other aspects of the admin and operations structure is, is something we would be committing to now before we understand those potential ripple effects, right? So, so that these positions are all very senior positions. So it creates sort of a top heavy structure that, that can then create pressures on some of the, the, uh, non-management functions within the agency, I suspect that's where the more money will come, <laughs> right? Like how do we create some equity within that, within the organization in terms of salary and compensation for work being performed? So just, again, I think these are all legitimate, you know, things for us to be talking about and, and reasonable requests for you to be making. I just really want to make sure that that we all have the information we need to understand the impacts of to the organization, uh, both in the short term and in the long term. Um, you know, before we are um, before before we are um, advancing um, these kind of you know structural proposals. Um, I, I'm not I'm not trying I'm I don't want to you know be intransigent on this. I just feel like I need a little bit more information um, to be to be uh, to be comfortable. But I also acknowledge that 
you need to have some flexibility to be able to organize and, and manage um, this authority in a way that feels like you are, uh, you know, rising to the occasion and meeting meeting the challenges that we're asking you to solve for. So um, I am going to be quiet now and let others ask questions. Thank you. Uh, Dow? Thank you. Um, well, yeah, I really appreciate what Lorena just uh, kind of unspooled there, helped us understand a little bit. You know, there's, there's, uh, in, in, in our staff's estimation, not enough money to hire this many people with the funds that I think are primarily or solely coming from the continuum of care, the federal funding. Mm -hmm. um, when you consider the fully loaded costs of the employees. Uh, and it implies that, of course, we'll have to budget and thus uh, uh, appropriate the funds, either the city or the county, or we would also welcome any other city entering into an uh, agreement with the organization to provide some of those funds. Uh, but uh, I do think that it's good that you're thinking about the staffing that's going to be needed to get the job done and the specific positions and developing those ideas and they need to be developed into um, a staffing plan that this body can adopt and a budget, including the FTE authority to hire the people needs to be developed and needs to be approved by both bodies. Um, uh, so what I would encourage, and you know, I mean, we're obviously, as Lorena said, kind of operating within a range here is um, to keep developing the staffing plan, the specific positions, what they are and will do, and, um, and what it will actually cost to hire them, not just for the rest of this year, but continuing on because that bow wave will exist. Um, and for us to, in an orderly way, adopt both the plan and the budget to allow you to advertise and hire. I'm, I'm fine with us reaching out and uh, seeing what kind of interest there is and what kind of candidates are out there, but we can't give somebody an offer until we have an adopted budget and the money to pay them, uh, including you know their retirement and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I don't even know, this just got me thinking what we're doing about things like risk pools and what do you do with the first employee you have to let go because they're not performing and then they sue you? Like, mm -hmm. how's that all being handled? It's probably all accounted for in the uh, ILA, but um, yeah. you know, once you start down this path, it just keeps going, going, and going. So uh, my, that would be my recommendation right now. I assume other people have some thoughts on that. Thank you, Executive. Uh, Jenny. Thank you very much. And uh, Mark, welcome. We are all very thrilled that you're here. And I am very um, thrilled that you're trying to play catch up. I think all of us are so cognizant that with the pandemic, not only did so much get frozen in terms of what any of our governments could do, but also think got in exponentially more critical when it comes to people experiencing homelessness. So we all really want to catch up. I, I would echo what Council President Gonzalez and and uh, Executive Constantine said, I think um, posting and figuring out who need, who's available and candidates, but we know you've got funding for four positions. Uh, my staff says as well that the fully loaded annualized costs are not in the budget yet. We still have to work with you in transferring over the employees from the city and the county and get them on your books, which is not gonna be an easy deal. So um, right now that staffing is, is being uh, afforded to the authority um, in this transition period. But I think that, I think what I'd like to see is, uh, you know, post for what you think you need, but get, give us a full staffing plan that's also, you know, working with the county and the city on how we integrate the current employees doing that work into the new authority, get them on the books, and what kind of both administrative and leadership staff you need um, out of the bag. You know, we try to identify in setting this up, but you're the person who's got to decide surveying the landscape what your needs are going to be so i'm supportive of starting the process of looking but i think before i could you know vote to say let's move i think we have to have a more fully cooked 
staffing plan and needs assessment uh, moving forward. Doesn't mean it wants, to, uh, we're not talking glacial pace. Um, and I don't think you have to get the budget before you start looking for people. So we're slowed down, but I do think that I need to more fully understand it as well and really appreciate uh, Lorena bringing this forward. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so it, to me, it feels like then the uh, movement towards consensus, which I'm, I, I wanna be super clear, does not, this still gets me to where I need to be, <laughs> right? It's like um, posting, but that doesn't mean sending an offer letter and it doesn't until there's like full budget reconciliation. So that like, because what I just heard you say, Mayor Durkin and, and Executive Constantine is, you know, the ability to, to start a pipeline is different than sending an offer letter. So am I hearing correctly, right, that you would be okay with beginning a process um, or am I misunderstanding? I think from my point of view, I can't speak for everyone obviously is beginning the process, but maybe even more holistically beyond posting these positions, really looking at kind of the nuts and bolts of what this new entity is going to have. Most of it, not glamorous back office positions that are the most critical for getting anything done. At the same time, you're hiring up for those kind of most visible positions. So, um, as you know, the, we will make, we'll continue, the city will continue to make our staff available to really work through those issues as the, as the county has been and partner with you um, as, you know, because it's, it's not an easy thing to start from scratch. And I think until you really assess some of the employees you're going to be getting from the two, city and county, it'll be hard to know what gaps you really have. Thank you. So that I think is, is a perfectly reasonable like to disaggregate and run separate and parallel processes I think is is fully within my capacity I think that the the um my hope <laughs> is that um truly in inside week one <laughs> um I would actually be able to like pick up the phone and be like okay now I understand the budgets that I'm looking at right um, and to be able to be much more granular in terms of expectations and answers and, and annualization. Um, for me right now, I'm, I'm really just looking at buckets of work uh, and where there is no one. <laughs> um, and and that, is, that is my primary um, uh, concern right now. But it, like peeling them apart and saying like, let's just run them as separate parallel processes, like that also feels good to me. My, my, um, what I think I would be concerned about, just to be really clear, is if um, we started to delay uh, the ability to advance some of these other positions that I do believe are, are just going to be mission critical um, until um, we're able to produce a full staffing plan. Because I, I see some of these positions as gating to that full staffing plan, right? Like, I don't, I don't believe, for example, um, that I can put forward a staffing plan that I'm 100% confident in um, without, uh, you know, some, some like better operational eyes than mine on some of these components, right? Um, or, you know, particularly, I think, with the ombuds role, um, which I think is very critical to the agency to live into its, um, uh, what it wants to be, right? Like, that's a, that is a function that has not existed previously um, in either city or county. And so having someone in that seat to say, this is this, to Councilman Brigadal's point, this is actually just new money, right? Like this, this is a whole scale new ask. Um, I just wanna make sure that, that I have folks who are able to um, uh, advise and to shape those portfolios so that when we're coming back, we're really confident on, on what we're saying. All right. Thank you. Uh, Jill. Thank you, Ed. We may be um, close to consensus. Perhaps I should have spoken up earlier. Um, but I, I really do believe that we're not taking on work that um, we don't already, already expect to embark on. The positions we're going to hire. We're going to need people doing this role. It's a matter of when. Um, the um, issue has gotten worse and we've been delayed. Um, I think it's imperative we move promptly. And if we can do that by opening the pipeline, but not sending the offer letters in the meantime, while we get the, while we make sure that the resources back, it, back up the offer, great. Um, but we need to, 
it's imperative to me that we move um, quickly and engage and make this happen and not um, forestall um, hiring positions that we know we're going to need. They may not have been in the initial list, but we know we're going to need and it's work that needs to be done. Thank you, Joe. Are there any other questions any, or any other discussion? Angela, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I guess with uh, some of the skills like new information, um, which is great. Um, and I guess um, I, I agree with Joe that I think that, you know, I, I think maybe we can break this into two parts. Um, what we're doing is we're authorizing these job titles um, and these, you know, eventually these positions. Um, I, I worry also that um, at some point um, soon, 60 days, um, Mark will have a staffing plan for us. And I, I want there to be an opportunity to get, get up and running faster than slower. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way we can work this out today to um, acknowledge the challenge with budgeting and staffing numbers, but also approve of the job titles uh, or some structure so that the process can continue to move forward. I don't want I I don't want us to have unnecessary delays in some areas. So, um, if someone has a solution to that, I would appreciate it. Thank you, Angela. Jonathan. Thank you, Chair. I just want to chime in here and say that um, you know, it, from my my perspective, it's kind of understandable that he would want to you know hire on these these core cool roles because these core cool roles would then be able to help in managing and mapping out the lay of the land and then assessing how many more or different type of staff that they need and so it just seems to me to be this logical linear progression of what what he would need um and then just thinking about like me being in some of the staffing meetings and understanding like how like you know how big an entire staffing plan for an entire new government agency will be within the time frame that we have i don't think it'd be realistic to try to forlay that um at this point, because just on the, the timeline that I, that I, that from my understanding, that you know he, he's going to need to to move fast and, and hit the ground running as soon as possible. So having all these steps and, and stones in place already would be very beneficial to to the work that he's going to do, and then would help you know churn out that full fully full staff plan, right? Um, and so I'm also looking for a, a solution. Maybe it is that you know take break it into two chunks while they while we do a um, resolution of, of the budget and, and the money's coming in and also the, the other staff. But we also just need to like realize that he needs to have a core team to be able to even do some of the basic things such as doing a landscape, you know, assessment of how much staff he'd need, right? So that's what I have to say. And that's just from my perspective. Thank you. So it, to me, it does feel like we are on the edge of consensus with um, breaking it apart and saying to authorize for role scope development and post to begin pipeline um, and then coming back quite quickly with budget analysis for that uh, for that authorization or final authorization which then leads to the ability to generate offer letters. I ultimately don't think that that creates a significant lag because of like just the time it takes to like write a role scope, get it posted, interview people, right? Like so that I, I think that that actually like gets gets solved solves the or circles the square so to speak um the one question i have for you all um is for for this these roles specifically um would you want to authorize a special subcommittee um uh or like just the you know uh leadership right um if i needed to like be like oh i'm gonna lose this person right and it's before our next scheduled governing committee meeting um, is is that an option? That's that is that would be ideal if there were like you know uh, SCA city county lived experience representation right? So like four like just four people who who people were comfortable with saying you know yes you can meet with this special subcommittee to get authorization for you know these roles that we have discussed. Angela. You so if I, thank you. If I understand the process or the possibility, um, so we could authorize um, this uh, staffing plan without authorizing hiring at until the next until we have more information. 
um, other than the roles that we've already said that we have money for. And then also we need a second motion to authorize um, the, uh, our exec committee group of four um, to authorize the hiring if in a special situation so that they could convene and do that without the full governing county commission, council, whatever they are, governing group. Is, is that my, is that how I'm understanding you, Mr. Dillon? Yeah. I, th <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> um, I think that's right. That like it would be authorization to do roll scope and post um, and then or to a resolution for that and then a resolution um, to allow the, the executive committee to approve the, the budget analysis once it is complete, which my hope, right, is that that is done within like two weeks. And so would be outside the cycle of uh, when we would be scheduled to come back together. Thank you for the clarification. All right, if there is no further discussion, uh, I will entertain a motion. All right, I think I'm the motion person. Um, so I, I would move that we approve of the title and scope of uh, the additional jobs that uh, our CEO has uh, given to us in the memo. Step one. Second. That was second, Ben. All right, uh, it's been moved by Angela and seconded by Zanita. Uh, any discussion? Uh, go ahead, Kalani. Just a clarification. Does this motion allow for posting but not offering, or does it just allow for creation of the job descriptions? And posting. And no posting. Offering. Thank you. Yes. Thank but you. not offering. No, but offering. not offering. Understood. No offering. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any other discussion? If not, uh, Sarah, will you take the roll? All right. Nancy Backus. Aye. Claudia Bazducci. Aye. Angela Burney. Aye. Dow Constantine. Aye. Jenny Durkin. Aye. Lorena Gonzalez. Lorena Gonzalez. Aye. Sorry about that. Aye. Thank you. Jonathan Hemphill. Aye. Andrew Lewis. Aye. Kirk McLean. Joe McDermott. Aye. Ed Prince. Aye. Zanita Reed. Oh, Zanita Reed. Thank you. That is 11 eyes, zero nays. All right, motion passes. Uh, is there another motion? Do you, you want to do the second one? I can do the second one also. <laughs> um, that, uh, this is, I, I, I would like to get, a, um, I guess, a little feedback on what the appropriate um, use of the executive committee would be because I want to give them the appropriate authority to make the decision, um, but I also um, understand fully that um, we, we will have to um, probably as, as this governing committee approve of what the executive group has done. And, and so is there, is, is, does staff have a good way to word that? Sarah. I should flag that we do not currently have an executive committee. Uh, we do have our co-chairs uh, okay. member blocks, so that could be a possibility if the governing committee is interested. Okay, but thank you for the correct terminology. And Sarah, do we have any um, a language in the ILA about um, emergency action? I do not know off the top of my head. I would need to go through the ILA and consult with other staff. Okay, I don't think we do. I don't think we do. I, so I think it. I think it would be, and and I want to be like whatever folks are comfortable with, right? Like I, this is very much for me, as I said, right? Like. I don't want to rush and break, right? I just want to move with due haste. And so to me, it's like if the um, if you all are comfortable empowering the co-chairs as a block to review and approve this, uh, this five-person budget, right? 
um, in a, a you know ad hoc meeting, um, then that's fine. If you want um, the co-chairs to take it and circulate it for three days for comments, right? And then you know we have a meeting about it. I, I do want to make sure that people feel like they are are having eyes on it and that it's not um, moving without them. Any other comment? Uh, Zenita? So I just want to make sure I understand um, if it would be a motion, then what we would be saying is possibly the block of four of our co-chairs actually looking at um, approving this budget analysis, whoever's figuring that out, um, and hopefully sending it to us so we can have input on it, but we're entrusting them to approve of it and say, we, we think everybody would go along, so this is what it is and send it to us and then back. Yeah, I think I think my ask, right, is that there be either through the co-chairs or or an ad hoc creation, right? Like someone who can work with me on an expedited timeline, um, so that if right, like if we if we do this dive on the numbers and we have a candidate, um, that we are are able to move to an offer, right, and not lose a candidate inside, you know, well, I'm not going to have budget authorization for another month. Um, that's that's my concern. Uh, Claudia, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I I had a similar question, but but what I heard was what Mark just reiterated, and that is that we would be empowering this group of folks to give the go ahead to make an offer for one of the five positions that goes beyond the five that were originally uh, approved and funded so that we would not lose a great opportunity to hire a really you know, great candidate between now and a month from now or whenever we have our next meeting. So as, with that understanding of what the authority would be, I would be comfortable doing it, but I do think, and I don't recall how many co-chairs we have, <laughs> newbie, uh, but I do think that we should have one representative from each of the four groups, King County, Seattle, Sound Cities, and lived experience that we would empower because I would be comfortable uh, if my interests were represented by either of my county colleagues in that subgroup, I, I wouldn't need to weigh in. And the second uh, piece of guidance that I would offer is, let's just make sure that however those meetings occur that they are uh, in keeping with the Open Public Meetings Act for Washington because if we empower folks to make a decision I think their meeting might have to be public. So let's just make sure that we get you the resources you need to do that. Yeah. Thank you, Claudia. Andrew. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It, and this is partly a point of clarification. For this proposed subcommittee to make this determination, I would imagine that would have budget implications. The interlocutory agreement Require two thirds of the governing committee to lock in such a decision. So I don't think we can delegate that authority to a subcommittee uh, per the confines of the agreement. I mean, my preference would just be that we be flexible in convening a special session if something like that should arise. I think that's the only way to do it in compliance with uh, the governing documents that structure the authority and the governing committee's business, especially on something that's this fundamental. So I don't think that it would be in keeping uh, to delegate that authority to four people to just make that call, uh, at least in the form of how the current structure is assembled. So I think we would just have to come back uh, and ratify such a decision. I don't know that that would be, um, controversial if everything was kind of baked in, if there was a detailed uh, plan on how it would go forward and sort of a source of money identified, uh, I could see that process going smoothly, but I don't think we can delegate that out to a subgroup of this body. So, so I would be voting against this motion. 
Any other comments? Is Anita? Yes. So if like um, Andrew said, um, if that is true, then if what we're trying to do is hire these five extra, would then we would need to go, you'd have to have then, I would think to make it as quickly as possible, you'd have to post those jobs, get your candidates, and then we'd have, you'd have to have them, you know, ready and we'd have to have a, a quick session, right, then to approve of all that. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. that sounds like the only way to not lose candidates if that's what we're trying to do. Right. So then, I mean, if, if that's the direction that the, the uh, GC would like to go, then the, the alternate route that opens is um, you just gave me authority to post, right? So I can post and start shaping the, the pipeline. Um, and then uh, we'd be looking at a, a quick turnaround on budget analysis um that gets us to like what the the final fiscal impact is um post reconciliation of out year admin expectations from city and county as they currently stand right um and then uh we would be i'd be looking to come back like in sort of short order and say like okay like here's here's what we got right um and so getting the full authority then to make those hires um but that would mean that uh it would likely mean because we're not scheduled to meet next month, as I recall, right? So it would be special session, um, and we'd be talking about special session somewhere in the the sort of two to three week, maybe four week range. Angela. Yeah, I just looked at the calendar. It looks like we actually don't have a meeting for May or June. If I look at my calendar correctly, I could. The next meeting, according to our agenda, is July. 15th. Is July, and so if if what Andrew has said is is the way we go, then we should be looking at a special meeting for the um, probably May when mm -hmm. we normally would have had this meeting. And maybe that's maybe that's a better route to get there. It gives um, our, our new leader a timeline, a tight timeline mm -hmm. to um, and maybe maybe more re realistic timeline to get some of this work done and bring it back to us for that specific purpose of um, looking to possibly approve of the hiring of those positions. And that might be a good solution for this group. If it works for y'all, it works for me. I, I, you know, I was looking, I think, you know, for a way to, to downgrade the scheduling impact, right? Um, but, I, you know, I, happy to hang out in May too. I, I can't remember. Do we need to vote on a special meeting? Yes. I think so. Anyone like to make that motion? This is Nancy. I'll make the motion that we hold a special meeting on May 20th. And Councilmember Gonzalez, I don't have that on my calendar. Uh, I think we changed out to quarterly meetings once, once Mark was hired. Yeah. I, I realized that after I um, popped that in there. But it looks like we're gonna meet in May anyway. <laughs> is, there, <laughs> is there a second? I will second okay. that. All right, we've got a motion from Nancy and a second from Zanita. Um, any discussion? Do we need to set the time certain? I think it'd be our normal meeting time. 10 o'clock. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Oh, you know, Aye. Sorry. Aye. I think that's supposed to be a roll call vote. Sarah, will you call the roll? All right. Uh, Nancy Backus. Aye. Claudia Balducci. Aye. Angela Burney. Aye. Dow Constantine. Aye. Jenny Durkin. Oh, I think we may have lost Jenny. Um, Lorena Gonzalez. Aye. Jonathan Hemphill. Aye. Andrew Lewis. Aye. Kirk McLean. Joe McDermott. Aye. Ed Prince. Aye. Zanita Reed. Aye. 
That is 10 ayes. All right, motion passes. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Chair. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. I was just going to say thank you. I so I will make sure uh, that in advance of that conversation that you all have complete briefing books so that to uh, Councilmember Lewis's point, it can be a quick conversation, hopefully. Um, and so if um, what I will look to get it out to you all um, roughly a week in advance. Um, and if there are any concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out directly so that we are able to um, really uh, get everything in line so that all your questions are, are um, answered. Thank you, Mark. Dow? Thank you. I, I just wanted to make a note of the fact that looking at my calendar, it's very unlikely I'll be able to attend that May 20th meeting. So I'm hoping either it's not terribly controversial uh, or uh, we're able to, I, I don't remember if I am able to have a person stand in for me at these meetings, but uh, it's just a, a day when I'm kind of booked up. Uh, executive, you have my commitment that uh, I will hold the controversy till September. <laughs> Thank you, Dale. Uh, we have no further business in front of us. Um, now, our next meeting is on May 20th um, at 10 a.m. Um, since there's no further business in front of us, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded that we adjourn by Nancy and then by Angela. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. See you guys on May 20th.